This is Physics 1B, Section 1377 for December 1st. And tonight we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. Let's get right into it. The first thing we're talking about is uh, the speed of a wave, the speed of a transverse wave. So leading up to this, we've talked about uh, the form that a transverse wave can take on. Let me get to full screen here. And now we're going to be talking about speed of a transverse wave. There is quite a bit of development of how you calculate this in your textbook but I don't find any of it to be even remotely interesting. So I'm just going to give you all the formula. This is what I did with the class on Monday, too. And we'll just talk about how you use it. So this is the speed of a mechanical wave. And in particular, this one refers to a wave on a string, although the same formula can kind of be generalized for other types of waves. Uh, inside of this, F is the tension in the string, and mu is the mass of the string divided by its length. And that's the, the speed of the wave. In general, the velocity of any kind of a wave in a medium is always going to have something in the numerator, which is going to be some kind of a restoring force of types that tends to drive the system back to equilibrium. Uh, divided by some kind of inertial quantity down here. So if we're talking about the wave, a wave of water or something like this, then the thing that shows up on the bottom down here would probably be the density of the water. And the thing that shows up up here would be something like maybe the buoyant force or something like that. Uh, but some kind of restoring force. But in general, we're going to get an equation that looks like this. And we're going to look at this problem that's right over here. Let's see if we can try to solve it. Do we have any questions about the definition? All right, so in this problem, I guess I'll make it a little bit bigger. It says one end of a two kilogram rope is tied to a support at the top of a mine shaft that's 80 meters deep. The rope is stretched hot by a 20 kilogram box of rocks attached to the bottom down here. A geologist at the bottom of the shaft signals to a colleague at the top by jerking the rope sideways. So this guy is going to send a pulse. It's going to travel up the rope. What is the speed of the transverse wave on the rope? If the point on the rope is in transverse simple harmonic motion with a frequency of two hertz, how many cycles of the wave are there in the rope's length? Okay. So we have a two kilogram rope. We know that, that's the mass of the rope. And tied to the bottom of it is another mass, these samples down here, that are producing a kind of tension in this rope. So what's the tension in this rope going to be? The weight of the rope and the mass. That's kind of what I thought too. Uh, for whatever reason, in this case, the book chooses to only include this, this mass right here for the tension. I don't really know why, but we'll, we'll keep with what they, they have here. So for us, our force, our tension force, is going to be the mass of the samples times gravity. And then to get mu, we're just going to take 2 divided by the length of the rope, which is going to be 80 meters, as we can see in the picture. So then we can find velocity by taking the square root of the force which is going to be just the mass of the samples times gravity divided by the mass of the rope divided by the length of the rope. So what we're going to get is velocity is equal to mass of samples, which is 20 kg times 9.8. Then we divide by mass over length. So little m is 2 divided by 80. Let me square root that. Let's see if I actually brought my phone out here. I thought I did. Here it is. So I get 88.5.
as the velocity of the wave on the stream. Do you have any questions? If not, then uh, over here, next thing we want to do is this is part A. Part B says to, if a point on the rope is in transverse simple harmonic motion with a frequency of two hertz, so if a frequency that's two hertz, the question is how many cycles of the wave are there in the rope's length? How can we figure that out? How many cycles of the wave are there in the rope's length? What can we do to figure that out? What kind of equations do we have? ideas. Nothing, huh? What does that mean? Cycles of the wave and the ropes link. What does that mean? What are they? What are they? What does that even mean? Cycles of the wave. What are they talking about? How many lambda? Yeah. Lambda is wavelength, right? So how many wavelengths can we fit inside of here? So if I have velocity and I have frequency, I can get wavelength because velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength. We can solve that for lambda. So lambda is going to be equal to velocity divided by frequency. So that's going to be 88.5 meters per second. We divide that by the frequency f, which is 2 hertz. A hertz is an inverse second, so we'll get units of meters. If we do 88.5 divided by 2, we're going to get 44.3 meters. That's the wavelength, but it isn't quite the answer. So as Ryan said, we're trying to find the number of waves that fit in here. So one wave has a wavelength that's something like this, a little bit more than half. We could fit a whole other wave in here, but not quite because it's 80 meters long and the wavelength, right? The wavelength is the distance from this point to this point here. That's one wavelength lambda. So if we take 80 meters and we divide by 44.3 meters, that should give us the number of waves that fit in this cycle, or the number of cycles that fit in the length of the string here. So if we take 80, and divide by 44.3. I got 1.8, and that is the answer. It has no units. You could say 1.8 cycles, I guess. All right, do we have any questions? Does that all make sense? Next thing we're going to do is talk about power in a wave. And this is another situation where the book goes through a long derivation. I don't at all see what value is gained out of it. But what they come up with is that if I have a wave, and it's a periodic wave that has some frequency f, 
and I'm, I'm transporting, you know, I'm sending waves down a string by like vibrating a rope or something like that, that there's going to be an amount of energy that's transported per second power that's going to be equal to, um, and the number they give us is the average power sent by the wave is going to be one half. You take the square root of mu times f. Mu again is the mass density of the rope, mass per unit length of the rope. F is going to be the tension in the rope. And we have to multiply that times omega squared and the amplitude squared, where A is the amplitude of the wave and omega is equal to two pi multiplied by the frequency. This is the angular speed, or the angular frequency. And then this gives us the average power per cycle in a way. It's, it's, power, it's average power per second, but it's, it's, it's averaged over one cycle, okay? Oh, I know, I remember now why this, this example is here. I was trying to think why the we need the information from this bottom example to solve this top example. Okay, so this is the power transmitted by a wave, or the energy per second, basically, right? And in this problem, we can kind of try to understand how this equation works by using it as an example. So it says, in part A, it says, in example 15.2, which I've included down here, at what maximum rate does Thraki put energy into the clothesline? That is, what is his maximum instantaneous power? The linear mass density of the clothes is, let's write this stuff down, mu equal to 0 0.250 kg per meter. And it says that Thraki applies a tension force of 36 newtons. So part A wants to know what the maximum power is. And I'll just tell you now that the maximum power is going to be two times the average power. That's this one half is a, due to time averaging uh, that happens all the time when you're talking about sinusoidal functions. Um, okay, so the maximum power then, which is two times this, should just be the square root of mu times f times omega squared times a squared. So this is going to be the square root of mu, which is 0.25, multiplied by the tension, which is given as 36. And then this is square rooted, and then the other stuff isn't. It says the, what do we have for frequency? Let's see. So we're given frequency is two hertz. That means that omega is two pi multiplied by that number. So omega is gonna be four pi radians per second. You can plug that in here, four pi radian over second. We're squaring that. The amplitude squared, the amplitude is given down here. 0.075 meters. So we get that the maximum power, the maximum instantaneous power is, oh, that last thing is squared. Is A is squared here? Okay. <clears throat> I get 2.66. Do you all agree? How did I get four radians? I didn't get four radians, I got four pi radians. So the equation is that angular frequency is two pi times frequency. Omega is two pi times the frequency. So then two pi times two is four pi. You see that? Part B says, what is his average power? Well, the average power is just the same thing that we just found divided by two. That's gonna give us the average power. So that's gonna be 1.33. Um, it says, as Thraki tires, the amplitude decreases. What is the average power when the amplitude is 7.5 mm? So if it's 7.5 millimeters, instead of, this looks like 7.5 centimeters to me, that means that our amplitude is now going to go to 0 0.0075 meters. And because it's squared here, you can prove pretty easily, we're doing average power, but the average power is now gonna be equal to 1.33 watts. Watts. Um, 
spots. And I think we just have to, since we're, we've moved the digit over one, uh, we just need to divide by 100, basically. So we're going to get 0 0.0133 watts. And of course, you can get the same number if you go back and plug this into this, uh, and then you, you're going to have to divide by two. But uh, that's pretty much it. Any questions? So energy is transported with waves, even though the medium itself doesn't move. And this allows us to find the rate at which energy is transferred, basically. OK, I believe the next thing we're going to talk about is standing wave. Oh, no, intensity now. A lot of random topics in this section that have very short uh, equations with them. So the next thing we're going to talk about is intensity of a wave. Um, using what's called the inverse square law. Okay, let's start off with something simple. So suppose that you're at a concert, and let's say this is the stage where the, where the, the main act is, and there's all these speakers here, okay? And so you've got these speakers and they're sending out energy, right? Uh, suppose that there's two different people at the concert, there's, well, there's lots of people, but there's one person here, and one person that's twice as far away, Okay, which person is going to hear more intense sound? The person that's closer or the person that's farther away? Got a big speaker here, the person that's closer, right? So the, what this is about in terms of what we're gonna discuss now is how much weaker is the sound heard by the person that's twice as far away? Is it twice as weak? Is it four times as weak? That's what we wanna figure out, okay? So in order to understand this, we have to imagine that as the source sends out energy, it's sending out energy in really three dimensions. So if I was to come over here and like draw a circle and then draw a circle here and tell you what the radii are. So let's say that the radius of this one is R1 and the radius of this one is R2. And then we realize that that energy that's being emitted by this wave, the sound wave, is actually going to spread itself out over the surface of a sphere, right? Like this. then what you can say is that you can define the intensity that someone hears by taking the power output of the speaker, so we'll just put power up here, and dividing by the way that that power spreads itself out. And so it's gonna spread itself out over the surface of the sphere. So we have to divide by the surface area of the sphere down here for pi r squared. And i is intensity in this case. So if you know the power output, and you know how far away you are, then you can find the intensity by doing this. This topic to me is really more closely associated with sound, so I'm surprised this topic doesn't show up in the next chapter, but anyway, it doesn't hurt to see it now. We can also make the following statement. If I wanna look at the ratio of the intensity one divided by intensity two, then we can say that the power output coming from the speakers is gonna be the same for both, because it's the source, so we can write it like this. And that allows us to say that the intensity one divided by intensity two is gonna be equal to R2 squared divided by R1 squared. This is the, the idea of the inverse square law, that uh, the intensity is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. That's what we call inverse square. And you probably have seen an inverse square law show up at least once in physics. Does anyone remember where? Where did you see an inverse square law before in physics? Something that looked like this. Hmm. You remember an equation where there's a one over r squared in it? One over r squared, does that look familiar to you? In fact, probably when you learned it, your teacher probably told you something about inverse square laws. No? Anyone? Inverse square law. Gravity, that's right, it's gravity. Um, when, you, uh, when you learn about gravity, the equation looks like this. 
you have two masses, m1 and m2, separated by some distance r, and the force of gravity between the two of them is equal to g, the gravitational constant, times m1 times m2, and divided by r squared, inverse squared law. If the force of gravity falls off as the inverse square of the distance, and so does the intensity of a sound wave, and the same thing is true in electricity. When we look at the force between two particles that are charged, they all follow an inverse square law. And the inverse square itself comes from the fact that we live in a three-dimensional universe, so that the surface of a sphere has a area of 4 pi r squared. If we lived in a four-dimensional universe, they would all be inverse cube laws. Anyway, so that is the inverse square law. We have a quick problem here to solve with it. Okay, so it says a siren on a tall pole radiates sound waves uniformly in all directions. At a distance of 15 meters from the siren, the sound intensity is 0.25 watts per meter squared. At what distance is the intensity 0 0.01 watts per meter squared? So we're told that we know the intensity at one location, 15 meters, that the intensity at that location, whoops, the intensity is 0.25, the units for intensity are watts over meters squared, at a distance of 15 meters. And we want to figure out at where where is it going to be the case that the intensity is equal to um, 0.1 watts per meter squared. So the question is, what distance is it? And we can basically just use this equation here. In fact, we can probably write it right here. Um, we know I1 and I2. We know R1, we want to find R2. So we're going to get that R1 squared times I1 over I2 should be equal to R2 squared. We can then square root both sides. And we'll get that R1 times the square root of I1 over I2 is going to be equal to R2. I'll scroll down because we're running out of room. Okay, so that equation, so if we plug everything in, R2 is going to be equal to the square root of 0.25 divided by 0 0.01. I'll leave the units off here just because um, they have this, they're the same units and it's a ratio. We multiply by R1, which is 15 meters. That'll give us our answer. Is it 75? What do you all get if you plug that in? 75? Okay. Pretty easy, right? We're going to see this show up again in the next chapter when we're talking about sound waves. You can see it right there. Um, and we'll also come up with another way to measure intensity using a unit called decibels. Decibels use a log scale to define density. Intensity, not density, intensity. Okay, anyone have any questions? I'm just picking up these little topics that show up in this chapter. I think now we're finally ready to talk about the major topic of the chapter, which is standing waves. I guess waves in general are the, the main topic, but standing waves are something that we want to understand. Okay, so we're gonna talk about four topics here, or three topics. And they are boundary conditions, and I'll show you an example of that one, um, wave interference, this is when two waves uh, collide with each other, we want to figure out what happens, the two waves are in the same location, in the same medium, and then, uh, well, and superposition. So the first one is boundary conditions. Um, your book has some nice drawings for this, but we're, we're just going to use the animation from the internet because it is a lot easier to show you than it is to try to draw a picture. So we're going to go to the FET website and we're going to pull up um, this one. I guess we can look at this one too, but I think this is getting a little ahead. We'll just focus on this one for now. 
Okay, so first thing is boundary conditions. We have the ability um, with this wave to have it have no end, in which case the wave would just, we can basically put a pulse right here and it will send this wave um, and it will just kind of just keep going forever as if the stream was infinitely long, right? We can also send a pulse here and the pulse will look like something like that. We can even get rid of all the damping, which will make it so that the pulse will maintain its size the entire time. That's what we'll start with by doing. Okay, uh, and I want to make this a little bit smaller too, so it's more spiky. There we go. There we go. So now let's look at what happens when I replace the, the open end with a fixed end. So now I have a fixed length of string, right? And this over this point over here is forced to be to not move, right? So now watch what happens when I send the pulse down there. See what's happening? What, what do you notice happens at the end when I send that pulse down? It happens again over here too, actually. What's happening down here? What happens to the wave? How would you describe what has happened to the wave? Energy is conserved? Maybe that's the explanation, but it flips. Exactly, it flips. So it starts off as like a crest, right? It comes in. And then upon hitting this, due to Newton's third law, this object pulls down on it as it tries to pull up, and it completely 180 degrees flips it. We call this phase inversion, or a, or a 180 degree phase reflection. In fact, we call what's happening here reflection because the wave basically bounces off of this point and then sends back the other way, right? Okay, so this is what you have to remember. When you have a fixed end like this, that makes it so that the wave bounces back but it flips over when it does so, okay? That's important. That's only with the fixed end, okay? So this is what the boundary condition tells us, okay? The boundary condition is that this point must remain fixed. That's the boundary condition. The effect is the wave flips. So when, it, when the boundary condition is a fixed end, the wave is going to flip upside down, all right? Back to normal motion. Bounce, 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 okay. So that's what happens there. So we're gonna restart this. Now we wanna see what happens when there's a loose end. So now this rope right here no longer is fixed in place, but it can slide up and down here. So tell me what's, what's different about this one. Should be able to figure it out pretty quickly. This end over here is still fixed, so it's still causing it to flip, right? But this one doesn't, right? In this case, after the reflection off of the, the end happens, the wave just kind of goes back with the same, it's, it changes direction. It was going to the right, now it's going left, it reflects, but it has no phase inversion. So this shows you one way in which waves can be a little bit different than particles. If I take a particle and I bounce it off of a wall, the particle will just bounce back at me. There's no way the particle can flip, up, flip upside down or anything like that, right? But waves can. So this is the loose end boundary condition and we can see that it causes no phase inversion. Much later on, if you take Physics 1D, you're gonna learn that light has a similar effect whenever it bounces off of like a mirror or something like that, or when it bounces off your dashboard. And um, just keep this, in mind, keep this picture in mind because it'll probably help you at that time. Okay, so we have these ideas of our boundary conditions. So I wrote that word there. That's what I mean by that is, is the end fixed or is it open? The second half of this is um, what happens when two waves hit each other, okay? And for this, what I'll try to do, we'll keep it in slow motion. And what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna try to send a wave towards that wave when it's, when it's coming to me. And I want you to watch what happens. We're gonna wait till it flips around. Here, we'll go back to normal motion. Okay, so wave bounces off, right? So I want you to, Think about what's gonna happen now. So I'm gonna send a new wave here. Now I have two waves that are moving towards each other. Would you say it won't have a phase inversion until, I don't, just stay with me, okay? I'll answer your question in a second. Um, so now I've got two waves, right? One wave is going to the right. I just created a pulse right here. This wave is traveling to the left. What do you think is gonna happen when these two waves hit each other? 
Ryan, um, it's not why mirrors are flipped now. That's just, uh, the mir mirrors are flipped because of the way the light bounces off. It's like, but your left side goes straight to the mirror and then it bounces straight back at you. That's why they're flipped. Um, what do you think is going to happen to these two pulses when they encounter each other? Are they going to cancel each other out? Are they going to double up and we'll get a bigger pulse for a second? Andrew says nothing. Go past each other. But what's going to happen w right when they hit each other? And they're going to cancel. Okay, let's see what happens. So watch very carefully because it'll happen very fast. It's going to happen right around here. Notice that just for a second, the I wish I could go. In, I wish I could go in reverse. The height of the wave doubled in size, right? They'll create a bigger wave. Andrew was right. They'll create a bigger wave. Now, someone else said Sergio said they'll go past each other. That's also true. Watch what happens if I keep playing it. So you see how the waves literally just pass straight through each other. It's like a surf, like a, like a surfing rebound wave. You'll have to tell me more about what you mean by that. But they they literally pass straight through each other. You know, if, if two particles come along, like let's say two billiard balls come along and they hit each other, they collide and then they bounce off, right? They don't pass through each other, but waves can pass through each other. And what we saw in the middle here is what we call constructive interference, and it's gonna happen a few more times. Now what's gonna happen is now we're gonna have a, a trough of a wave, like a minimum, and a crest of a wave, like a maximum, and now they're gonna hit each other and now we're going to see more wave interference. We call this wave interference. Whenever two waves are traveling towards each other in the same medium, we're calling it wave interference. What do you all think is going to happen now when this wave encounters this wave? Because the backwash crashes onto an... Yeah, exactly, Ryan. That's exactly right. You're right. Yeah. That's right. So, like, the the wave backwashes back, but there's, there's effectively two waves, and they add together. Okay, Ren, uh, Andrew's saying it's going to come flat. Let's see. Yeah, well, I didn't pause it quite fast enough, but just for a moment there, it was like there was no wave to begin with at all, right? And of course, they will just continue to move right past each other. These two waves will continue to interact with each other. Now they're going to bounce on the bottom. Constructive interference. And then we're going to get destructive interference. And then we'll get constructive again. So they're going to double up. So it's going to go to a height that's like up here. See, there's double the size. And so on and so forth. So when two waves pass through each other, or when two waves are in the same location at the same medium at the same time, you get what's called wave interference. And interference is just meaning you're adding the waves. So if one has a negative amplitude and the other one has a positive amplitude, this is positive, positive, it doubles. If one's negative and positive, it will do like this. Now there's another possibility we can have. Here, wait, wait, wait. Another possibility we can have is I have a wave going down like that that has a certain amplitude, and I send another wave coming like this. They're different sizes, so they can't completely look at what happened to the, the, the medium of the wave. It will eventually reset itself to the original setting, but anyway, so you don't have to have equal pulses. These two will just add together. So if I have a pulse that's this height plus a pulse that's this height, you just add them together to get the total uh, total amount. Okay, let's go back to ask a question that Andrew would ask. Andrew would ask, would you say it won't have a phase inversion until it hits the origin? Um, I think you're misunderstanding. The phase inversion occurs anywhere that there's a fixed end, right? So if I have a fixed end here and a fixed end here, and I send a pulse down, then that pulse is going to phase invert on both points, right? So I don't know what you mean by origin. Any place where there's a fixed point, that's where there's gonna be a phase inversion. When it's a loose end over here, then only this side is fixed and that side's loose, right? It gets inverted once per cycle over here because this end is fixed, you know? Always at the fixed end, it's gonna invert. At the loose end is not gonna invert. Okay, so I think we've covered all the main topics. I will try to summarize them real quick here. Although I think, I hope that you got the, uh, um, the in general idea. So boundary condition is Fixed versus open end, or loose, I guess loose is the better word here. Loose end. Okay, wave interference is the idea that 
waves basically can add together. Let's, that's really superposition. The wave interference occurs when um, two waves in the same medium at the same point. We have what's called constructive interference. This one occurs when you have, for example, like two maxima. And we have destructive interference. This is when you have one maxima and one minima, or one crest and one trough. But in both cases, the principle of superposition tells us what the total wave is going to look like. Okay. Uh, when I have multiple waves um, in a medium that are at the same location, you can add the amplitudes. So if I have one wave that's moving with a frequency with a uh, according to a wave equation that's y1, and I have another wave that's moving with a wave equation that's written as y2, the total is just equal to the sum because the wave amplitudes are like scalars effectively. All right. Okay. So, one thing that we can use these concepts to do is to explain how it is that you can produce um, such consistent notes from things like a piano or a guitar or a flute or any of the uh, any instruments like that, both wind instruments and what are they called? Stringed instruments? So stringed instruments and wind instruments. We want to explain why it is that you can produce such pure notes over and over and over again with such consistency with these objects, okay? And the answer is due to the production of what's called standing waves. So that's our next topic here, and it's directly related to what we just discussed, standing waves. So here's the idea. Suppose that I'm just going to show you as, as well as I can. These are some pictures here. We'll see, we'll see after, after I try to show you here if you, if you feel like it's accurate. So in order to do this, you have to have, well, you don't have to. Um, the one we're going to discuss right now is going to be fixed end on both sides, okay? So you already saw that if I send a pulse down here, because there's no damping, that means that the, the wave never gets weaker. If I turn this up, the wave will eventually go away, right? See, the wave basically is off. But if I turn this down, then I'm, if I send a pulse here, that pulse will basically just oscillate back and forth forever, right? Okay. So what happens... If I allow this to, I'm going to go slow motion here. If I allow this to oscillate up and down constantly, right? I'm just going to pause for a second here. So we've sent a wave down, right? And this is what the wave looks like, right? We also saw that when I have a fixed end over here, the effect of that fixed end is going to be that it's going to make this wave as it comes in flip directly upside down, right? So now what we're going to see is that we're going to have one wave traveling this way. That's the wave that we produce. There's a reflected wave coming back in this direction, except that reflected wave will be 180 degrees out of phase with the original wave, right? And as a result, it's going to create constructive and destructive interference at different places along the rope. So let's see what happens. So we're going to pause for a second right there. I want you to kind of look at what's happening with this piece here, this piece here, and this point, and this point. It won't last long, so pay attention, okay? So watch just basically from starting from this point here, just look at this one waveform and focus on what it does, okay? And also look at that one point right there. Do you see how it basically just, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. How would you describe what you just saw? Watch, watch, it'll probably last for like one more second, one more cycle. Boom, yeah. Do you see that? It went flat, yeah. But what happened to this wave right here, this little waveform? It went flat and then what happened? It mirrored to the axis, right? So it started up here, then this part basically bounced down while this part bounced up. Let's see if it still does it again. It's doing it one more time. It's going to stop now because there's now another wave traveling down here that's going to cancel it out. But if we let this thing run, 
that same pattern will appear where there will be places where the wave seemingly stands in place. It happens a lot right around. If you just look at this portion right here, it happens quite a bit. See, that just goes up and down and then up and then down. Now another wave's coming and it's gonna disrupt it again, but for a while there, you can kind of see, this is what we mean by a standing wave, is when this, this piece of the wave here kind of just continually moves up and down between two nodes. These are the nodes here and here. Now, I, I've never quite been able to get this to work properly. Wait, pause it, restart. It's dependent upon frequency here. If I lower the frequency and we try again, let's see what happens. We'll leave it go into normal motion too. So there is a way to do this. I've just never been able to figure out what the right frequency is to actually produce a standing wave on here. Um, so if you want to play with this yourself, you can. But there's a certain particular frequency. I could even figure out what it is actually, probably. The problem is we don't know how long this thing is. Yes, yes, we do, I lied. How long is this? What does that look like to you all? From green dot to green dot. So I'll put this right on this green dot here. We're gonna look at that green dot right there. How long is it right there? What is that? It's in centimeters. What does it look like to you? What is that point right there? It looks like it's right about there. How many centimeters is that you all think? Seven and a half. Maybe. It's a little shorter, seven and a half there, right? Because this would be 7.2, 7.4, 7.6. It looks like maybe 7.45. 7 let's call it 7.45, okay? All right, we're gonna do a little calculation here. We're gonna learn pretty soon that the frequency of a standing wave, okay, is gonna be equal to like n over 2L. root f over mu. Oh, there's just no way to figure it out because we don't know. I, I, I knew this wouldn't work. I was trying to think about it for a second. There's no way to figure out what the right frequency needs to be. There just isn't any way. Because they don't really tell us how much ten, they, they, if we had a numerical value for tension or we knew something about the quality of the thing we could do it, we just can't. It's too bad. Maybe after you learn the math you can try to figure it out yourself. But uh, Anyway, that's kind of a standing wave. It goes away, and then it comes back, and it goes away, and then it comes back, and then eventually the whole thing just stops. What if we, uh, what if we go to like a really low frequency? Let's see if we can see. I really would love to produce a standing wave for you all. It's kind of there. Oh, that's that's actually really good right there. Just it always goes away really fast. That's a standing wave almost. So this thing right here, we call a node. We call this a node, we call this a node because it kind of stays in the same place. See right there, that point is basically just not moving. That is a standing wave. When this point right here stops moving and there's just two full waves on here, we're actually getting pretty close to, to finding it. Maybe we can figure it out, let's see. Do we want to go smaller? Let's go down to 8.83. 8 let's see if we can make a sense. See this point right there, oh, for a second it was doing it. There it is, kind of locks in place. See how that point sometimes just locks in place like that? Yeah. Anyway, I don't know why they don't have, uh, oh, maybe there is a way to do it on here. I think there is like a, here it is. This is it. I didn't show this to my other class. It's a flash one, so I don't know this will work, but sometimes it does. Okay, so what we can do actually to get this one second. I know I can make this work for you. Let's see, Oxstars one text. We need to open this program. And then I need to open copy this. Windows, this one. Wait, can I just find it? F L A S H. There it is, W Flash Player. Then I need to go over here and do this. Oh, that's not it. 
I just want to copy the link. I wonder if I typed it in wrong. Okay. So what is it called? Normal modes. So we need to go through here. What I'm trying to do is to download the flash file because these things don't support flash anymore. What was it called again? Normal modes. N O R normal mode. There it is. And then we need to get the SWF file. SWF, there it is. And now if we open this, it won't work, but what we can do is we can copy this. Oh, no, 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 not that. This. And then I can come over here to this flash player. Uh, didn't I open it? Whatever, we'll just open it right here. And then we go file, open, paste, okay. And this should work, it did work, nice. I forgot this one was in here. It was hiding from me. Okay, so let's put a standing wave on here. I believe we're gonna start with just this one. So there we go, that's standing wave. That's way easier than what I was trying to do. So on a standing wave, we have any fixed point that does not really move very much, we call a node, okay? So this point here and this point here are nodes, okay? Uh, let's stop this, move back to the initial positions. Is that the zero positions? There we go. And now let's look at mode two. Mode two is such that there's a full wave that fits in here, one full wavelength, right? And if I click start, that, I think this picture down here is almost a little better, but this picture is still quite good. Now this has become a node. Is the, do you not see, I don't know if you can tell that this is what I was trying to go for in the previous one. Anyway, um, so now you have a full wave that fits inside of here with three nodes. There's a node here that's not moving. There's a node here that's not moving. And there's a node here that's not moving, right? Now, if we go back to the original wave, which was this one, let me let it oscillate back and forth. This is like half of a wave. So the length of the string in this case is exactly equal to a half of a wavelength. And if we go down to the th mode three, now we have, there's a full wave here. Wait, can I pause? Is there a pause button? There we go. There's a full wave from here up to here, and then another half wave. So there's like three half wavelengths that fit in here. And that's a standing wave. You can actually do this with, you know, a sibling or family member or friend if you want to, where if you take like a long extension cord, it helps to have something that's kind of weighty. So like a, one of those orange extension cords work really well, but you could do it with, uh, if you have like a rope that's like used to like, but any kind of thick rope, like if you're a, if you have rope for climbing or rope for skiing or something like that in a boat, what you can do is you can hold the rope and you can have each of you basically whip the rope as hard as you can. And eventually you'll find a balance where you can produce these modes on the string. And I'll sh I can show you an example of that at the school, but we're obviously not there now. So let's look at the math of this. And let's look at their pictures, see if we can understand something about these pictures now that we've seen it. So here's an example of different standing waves, okay? This is the string is one half of a wavelength long. These things right here are the nodes. Anyone here take physics 2A at the school? Do any of you take physics 2A at the school? 2A, not 1A. Did you all do the lab, the, the standing wave on a string lab, where you basically produced these uh, little uh, these little patterns like this? You didn't? Oh, okay, well, sometimes people don't do it. Anybody else? No? That's too bad. I always do it because it's really fascinating. It's a really cool lab. What you end up doing is you have this string and you basically increase the tension on the string. And don't, we'll derive that equation in a second. Um, you, you increase the tension in the string and you can show that you can produce like, you know, this, we call this the first mode. We call this the second mode, third mode, fourth mode, okay? And then down here at the bottom is a kind of idealized picture of it. Now really what's happening here is just constant interference because what's happening is that you're sending a wave down the string, right? But then the reflected wave comes back in the opposite direction. And that's what makes it so that you always get a point here 
that doesn't really move. We call that a node. Now, why are we interested in standing waves? Well, it's because standing waves show up all over the place in nature. So, for example, if you take a guitar, so let's say you have a guitar. Okay. On a guitar, you've got like six strings, right? But let's just focus on one of the strings. So you're going to have a string that's tied from here down to here, right? And you've got obviously this opening down here on the guitar. And the whole point of the opening is really just to make the sound kind of echo out of the, the system to kind of amplify the sound a little bit. When you come along and you just strum the guitar, right? So if you take a pick, right? And you strum the guitar. What happens is that the, the guitar string starts to vibrate. You can see it vibrate. If you look closely enough, you can visibly see it vibrate. And what's going to happen is it's going to vibrate through a standing wave. So it's going to kind of vibrate like this. It's just going to wobble, you know? And it'll kind of look a little bit like this, although it's going to be much skinnier in terms of its amplitude, right? And yeah, when you pluck the string, it produces a standing wave, okay? And we know that the wavelength of that standing wave is equal to the length of the string divided by two, right? And there's a connection between the wavelength and the frequency that we hear, right? Which is that uh, velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength, right? So that means that by changing the tension in the rope and by changing the length of the rope or the string, you can change the sound that comes out of it, right? So that's one of the reasons we talk about standing waves. They, they also show up not just in sound, um, and they don't just apply to stream instruments. The same thing happens inside of a wind instrument where the air inside the tube is subjected to similar conditions. But they also show up these standing waves in quantum mechanics. In fact, uh, let's talk about this stuff and then I'll, I'll talk about how, um, we'll talk about how LED screens work or some types of LED screens nowadays work off of standing waves as well but instead of using standing waves of sound, they use standing waves of light. Okay, so let's go through the theory. In fact, actually, this is probably, I've introduced it, we've talked about it. Let's take a break, let you all think about that, and then when we come back, we'll, we'll finish the theory and do some problems. So we're gonna break until, I think it's 7.35 p.m.